change the work and lectures accordingly. But anyways, I'm just going to assume you guys are fine. Okay, so today, all I have <coughs> is maybe half a dozen functions that uh, Vincent gave me. Right, so these are all the functions that all lectures are going to try and write dog strings for. So today, I want to look at a function, write dog strings for it, and then write the function itself, and then test. Right? So the first one's quite easy. Uh, write test for the following function, then implement it. So the function is rmax, and it returns the larger of x and y. Forgot my glasses today, so it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's Wednesday. Okay. Let's come up with test cases. So remember the guidelines from yesterday, right? Typical use, edge case use, boundaries. So. Give them to me. Yeah. Three and five should be. Okay, so that's. Okay, more. Yeah. Good choice, right? Because this is a boundary condition. And this should be two. Yeah. Well, you now. Yeah, negative 1 and 0 should be 0. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two, two positives, two... Okay, so we have a positive, 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 po positive boundary condition, negative 0. Should, we also need... Something like, technically speaking, we should like do both versions of each input, right? So should, we should have a 3.5 and a 5.3. If, if we, sorry, if we really wanted to like be very comprehensive in our testing. Uh, 2 and 2, minus 1 and 0. What else? What else do we got? Any other edge cases? Zero, zero, yeah, it's like a edge cases for a bunch of reasons. So that should be zero. What about R max for two negatives? Yeah. Uh, did we not have a mixed one? Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, and that should be two. Okay, is there anything redundant in here? Aside from like this one, which is... I wouldn't really call that redundant, right? Because you're switching the switching the input, right? I could, uh, yeah. Actually, following that, it's redundant for all the non-equal cases. You can add in the second case where you reverse the order of x and y. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in every single case, we should technically be doing the permuted input case as well. Um, I don't want to do that though, because <laughs> this is going to get really long. Okay, um, so how can we write R max? Can we write R max with like, yeah? If x is larger than y, return x, and then outside return y. Mm. You want me to write this? Without the else. Just return y. Oh, well, okay, it's functionally equivalent. Is there a way we can do it without using like the built-in comparison operation? Yeah. Yeah, we can use the max, but like, what's, what's the most, like, can we implement this in any way that it's not, we don't end up making it trivial? I don't actually know, like, how we, we could do this. We could test if, no, but... Yeah, I know, but then we're going to test in the built-in max. I want to write something, maybe. Yeah, okay, why not? Uh, so I want to return the last element of this 
think I actually have to make a list. X, Y, uh, L is equal. Okay, I think it's L dot sort. I forget. Uh, Oops. Great. Okay, so it's sorted in place. Okay. So that should work. Okay. It's a stupid way of doing doing this, but uh it satisfies my desire to not use the inbuilt stuff. Okay, so Python. Let's read in our Wednesday. Oh, I should do this import doc test, just so I don't have to call this every single time. Uh, so doc test dot test mod. Oh, we passed them all. All right, well, that one, that one was fairly easy. What are you? Um, all right, easy. Next one. Increment the value associated with k in the dictionary h. If k is not a key in d, add k with the value 1. k is immutable. Okay. So basically, I have a dictionary whose values are strings. Oh, sorry. I have a dictionary whose keys are strings and whose values are integers. And what we want to do is just increment the value at h of key, and if h of key doesn't exist, then I want to set it to the default of 1. Okay, so we're going to write it second and do the doc string test first. Okay, so how do you how do you want to do this? And remember, I said we could do something like define a dictionary first. Right. Do I have to 2 to 2, 3 to 1? Oh, yeah, I think I have to do this. All right. So I'll just do it like this. Okay, so I can just create an arbitrary dictionary, right? I can say A goes to 1. Uh, whoops. B goes to 2. Uh, okay, let's say that. And then what do I get if I increment count uh, on H? For a, what should that return? Yeah, remember we need to be really careful with how we space here. So I actually should be putting tailing space like this, even though I don't like that. Okay, so a. Oh, and I I should use the. There's a bunch of stuff that's wrong here. Because uh, if I use these quotes, I have to use the single quotes. So this should be like this, right? Just showing you how very careful you have to be when entering these things. And then A should go to, she'd be at what, 2? Okay. Great, yeah. What happens if I increment count uh, well, I guess I have to reset H. Uh, no, okay, so if I increment count on C, what should I get back? Yeah, but what order? Why? Dictionaries are on order. So, like, I don't actually know, like, how I'm supposed to do this without a unit test. There's no such thing as the end of a dictionary. Dictionaries are unordered, right? Dictionaries don't have order. <laughs> yeah, but it could be however it's like storing it in memory, right? It could be a variety of things that are unpredictable. But like the point is, they're unordered, and we shouldn't try to guess the order of an unordered object because it's not deterministic. It's just basically where it happens to be in memory, how things are set up. Yeah. 
then the the dot test we just call the element at that specific location and get the correct value. And for example, if we if we want, if our purpose was to add a new value to C that was one, mm. instead of dot testing the entire dictionary, we can just say H of H and C. Yeah, but now you now you're just sort of making a unit test and simulating it with a doc test. I don't know how to do this. I know you love hearing that from your professor, but, well, let's look it up. <laughs> Doc string testing Python on dictionaries, right? Maybe there's something I'm missing, right? Okay, I know how to do it. So we have a dictionary H. We can always convert this H to items, right? Which gives you dictionary items, and then I can always take these items and then list them and then sort them. And everything's disappeared. That's great. Let's take L, let's list this, and let's just do L dot items. Hmm. Okay, hold on. Does everything include a dictionary? No. Okay. Let's just write this and move on. Like, I don't, I'm unsure what the point of this question was, unless it was to say a string, like a doc test here is impossible. Yeah. Yeah, but like, again, that, that feels to me just like simulating a unit test, right? Uh, like I agree that it would work, but then we might as well just do a unit test, right? Maybe I can... All right, do you want me to show you how to do a unit test? Maybe I can show... Because that's going to be the thing that we're going to do at the very end, but maybe I can just do it now since it came up. Uh, just let me grab it. Uh, week 8... So I was reluctant to show you this, right? Because you actually have to create an object. And we haven't taught you guys what objects are. So I'm going to show you this in such a way that um, most of it's not going to make any sense to you. But I can say, fill in these values, and then, and then everything will work. OK. I'm going to remove all of this. So there's, this, uh, there's a library called unit test. And what this unit test will allow you to do is create this sort of uh, test class or test object. I'll just call it test. Um, and then you can create a series of sort of number tests or name tests. So this is testing the absolute value, right? So uh, the input to the absolute value is 8. The expected value of 8 when given to the absolute value is 8. And the result. Um, which may differ from your expected value in the case of an error, is the absolute value of the input. Now, calling this unit test gives you this function, this assert equal. Uh, and what this does, this is like a fancy function, which is going to tell you if two objects are equal. Uh, so like 1.0 and 1 will be equal, right? Even though they're technically not the same thing, uh, they are mathematically equivalent. So I'm going to read this into Python. Where am I? Oh, geez. It's going to be somewhere buried. Uh, Python day three. Test numbers. Okay, so I've read that into Python, and now I can do something like uh, unit test dot 
Uh, what was it? Mm, I forget which one it was. Uh, unit test dot main. Okay. So I actually I can just call unit test. Huh? Oh, I need to put this back. Unit test dot main. Yeah, this is why I should never go off script. Okay, that's how you call it. Um, so we're getting the same type of test here. Let me make it verbose, just so you can see. Oh, there is no verbose. Okay. Anyways, this is, this code is just walking through these set of tests, and let's let's write another one. So this was test one. Uh, test two. And let's make it fail. So I can say the input is minus three, the expected result for the absolute value is three, and the result is the absolute value of the input, right? So this is going to fail, that second test. Oh, good lord. Uh. Uh, unit test dot main. No. How did I pass that? Oh, no, I, I wrote a correct test. Okay. Um, the input is minus 3. Let's say the result is uh, minus 7. All right, so that's definitely going to be wrong. All right, so there's our fail failure. Okay. So it says in line 16 of your test, so this guy, um, this assertion failed, and then that's why we wrote this message, just to make it a look a little bit more readable. So it's saying there was an assertion error. 3 is not equal to minus 7, the, uh, which and minus 7 was the expected answer to absolute value of minus 3, which of course it's not. So we were expecting 3 and received the minus 7. So this is a unit test where you have to use an object. <laughs> so don't, we're not, I don't, I don't think we're going to test you on unit testing. I just want you to be aware that such testing exists. And if you want, you, you just have to add one function to this for every test that you want to create. Right, and you should be giving your like things names, right? Like uh, edge case for you know condition one, right? right? And, and you could have some file that's like ten thousand lines long, right? testing all of your all of your cases. But anyways, it's a little bit of a diversion. Um, let's just skip this one to the dictionary. I'll come back to you on Friday about what to do in that case. Um, let's do this one instead. So I think this one's on strings, so at least we can know we can write a doc test properly. All right. Okay. Return the indices, return the indices in C's, a string, at which non-overlapping copies of sub C's start. Sub C's is not empty. Okay, so I see. So we have a sentence, a cool pool look, and we have the substring OO, and OO starts at 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, we don't count this one because it's overlapping. Then we have another OO at 9, and then another OO at 14. Yeah. If there is another, okay, let's just add that as a test case. Uh, so if we had this one instead, four, then you'd have one at three and then one at five, yeah? Yeah? Okay, hit me up with test cases now. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, sure, x. What, what are we expecting here? Empty, okay. What else? Yeah. That would be a zero. And then a zero and then every four after that. So zero, four, eight. Is that correct? Zero, three, seven. Six. Okay, more edge cases. Remember, corner cases, empties. Like what happens if I search ABC for empty? Subscript is non-empty. Okay, what happens? Okay, then I can't do that. CS, we do have CS is empty already. That should return empty. Well, we should see what happens if we don't find anything, right? That was the one you're going to do? Yeah. Anything else? This can't be every case. Uh, I don't know. Is this a... Is this test case meaningful? Like, is that any different than this one? Right, this would give us what? Zero, two, four. Yeah, screw it. Uh, all right. Is that it? Is that really all we want? Yeah. I don't think that's different. I think that's redundant. Like I don't don't treat. So this is something that I'm puzzled by. Like these are all just characters. Like doing something for a a a a is is the same thing as doing it for space 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 space. Like space shouldn't occupy a special category in your mind. For being a non-character. It, it just feels like it's not a character because it's an invisible character, but it's a character. You then you, yeah. That's actually not a bad idea. So what should this be? Zero, one, two, three? The tab is four spaces, then we should find the period at every Every place, yeah. What did I just say? Yeah, but I'm, you can answer your own question. No, of course it, it it shouldn't matter, right? Because again, like, don't like these are all just strings, right? You're giving them a type that they don't have, right? It's a string that's also an integer, which has an integer data type. But like, you're, these are all just like a big pile of characters. Yeah. Maybe if we put in a string, uh, a, a new line escape sequence, and try to find the backslash, or return the Okay, so you're saying if I do what? New line. New line. And try to find the backslash. Oh, and try to find the backslash. Jeez, okay. Should return empty. Yeah. No. Non overlapping. Yeah. Is the guy satisfied with this? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I laugh, but these are good test cases, right? So, <laughs> no, one and two, right? No, zero and one, right? I think the length of th those four slashes is two, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, because what you have is two, you have a string of two slashes, right? And if we're looking for single slash in two slashes, then it's at the zero position and one position. Okay, anything else? Okay, you guys implement this <laughs> and make sure it passes all test cases. Um, that's actually fun. Okay, let's do the next one.
right? So I'll, I'll put all of these things online afterwards, and then you guys can go and fill it in for practice. It's good practice. Okay. Let's do this one now. Insert A after each occurrence of B in the list, list X's, okay? So let's just come up with a typical, which also serves to prove that we know what we're doing. Um, okay, hello world. And maybe after every E, I want to insert a, yeah? List, oh, int, int. Oh, that makes things easier. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This should return what? 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. OK. Insert after empty 1, 2. Empty insert. Insert out. OK. Give me more test cases. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Hmm? One with multiple occurrences, okay? So let's just do this one again. And now I'll say we should replace a one with a one. All right, so what should we get now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Yeah. Return type is none. Oh, because uh, you're getting a file, you're getting a list pointer. So you're just modifying the list in place, like a global. Okay, so let, let maybe this is a new one's worth checking out. Um, if I create a list like this, let's see. <laughs> so I hope I know what I'm talking about. Let's take this in, and let's just take y's and append something, and then return none. Uh, so there's x's, this is foo of x's, here's x's again, yeah, right? It's, it's all because of this, the pointers, right? So um, I could return the list, but that's just going to return a, a pointer anyways, yeah. Yeah, you're right, let's, uh, let's return a list of integers, yeah. Yeah, let's just let's just return a list of integers. Yeah. Empty. You can't have empty imp type. Yeah, like you can do zeros. Zeros is the empty of that. But like, again, remember, we're not testing for violations of contract because there's like an infinite number of ways we could violate the contract. The, well, no, the header gives the contract, right? I'm saying I need a list of integers, an integer, and an integer, right? So you can't give me a string as the second one, right? You have to give me an integer. There's, and you can't give me A because that's a name and not an integer, right? Yeah. <laughs> we did all of these wrong. Insert A after each. Okay, so I'll just do this. <laughs> then it becomes right. <laughs> we've, we've just been doing everything backwards. Okay. That's also fine. Um, so you're comfortable with this? Be these being your only test cases? All right. So go implement that as well. So we hit every edge case. 
I don't think it's meaningful to put negative integers in here. Zeros don't really do anything either. Okay, so you implement that one as well. How much time do we got? 10 minutes? Here's another one. But this is another one with dictionaries. All right, this is better. Okay. So on Friday, I'll find out what we're supposed to do with dictionaries in terms of doc string testing. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to do it without just basically turning it into a unit test by forcing some type of ordering. Um, okay, so return the average grade for all the students in grades where the inner list contains a student ID and a grade. Okay, so here's a list of lists of uh, student number grade pairings. I don't know why the student number should be a string, but it is. Uh, and you basically just want to find the average grade. So. 83 and 90 and 70 divided by 3 should be 81.0. Uh, so don't forget that we're returning a float. So I will nominate one edge case. Oops. I'm going to give each student a 0. Okay. Um, so the average should be 0, 0.0. Another edge case I want to give is the empty list of students. What should the average for your empty list of students be? Who said that? You said everyone, they're all pointing to the left. You get extra marks, whoever said, yeah, okay, now, you, now you're nominating yourself. Um, the empty sum is equal to zero and the empty product is equal to one. Did you guys know that? Um, it's, hmm. So if I have something like the sum for x in a set, like 1, 2, 3 of x, this is going to be equal to what? 1 plus 2 plus 3, right? But some like somehow how we want to write this is like this. The sum from i equals 0 to n of some sequence, this is actually equal to, you take the last one off, and then you add the remainder, right? This is like saying 1 plus 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 1 plus 2 plus 3, right? We're going to be sort of recursively applying the sum. So the question is, if I repeat this process over and over again, I get x of n plus x of n minus 1 plus this will go all the way down to sum of i equals 0 to 0 of xi. And what does it have to be? What does the last thing I'm adding here have to be? Zero. So it has to be like that for, defini for definitional purposes. Right? Otherwise, our techniques for summing wouldn't work. The same thing is true for multiplication. Right? The the product of the empty collection has to be 1, right? So we can make this recursive definition for taking the product. So I'm going to say the, an average of empty grade should be 0. Uh, yeah, because that's... A, so this one, will also, this one checks division by zeros too, right? Because I imagine you many would write some type of line that said... Uh, sum of the grades divided by number of students. And if the number of students is zero, you're going to have a division by zero. So this, this one should check divisions by zeros. Yeah? Uh, well, oh, you are correct. So I should be doing something like, yes. OK. What else do we got? I don't think we can give negative grades, can we? Yeah, but like, isn't that an implicit assumption? Like, a grade is a percentage, right? How can you have like negative two percent? Like, I don't, I don't think it makes sense. Well, what do you guys think? Do you think we should accept negative grades for this? 
Or do you think a grade is something that is like implicitly non-negative? I'm just going to add that as, a, as an assumption. Grades are positive, right? Oh, grades are non-negative. You can't have a zero grade. Negative. Okay. Yes. Duplicate list. Sure. Although I guess implicit to a student list would be that there should be no duplicates. But it um, doesn't actually say that there can't. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so grades may contain duplicate students. These should be removed. Right? No, let's just make an assumption. Uh, no duplicate students in grades. Uh, so I got to take this one out. Okay, one more. One more. Yeah. Sure. Grades are all the same. And that should return 70.0. Okay. One more like non-redundant one though. Uh, another good one. Not something that can throw a spanner in the works. Yeah. Just trying to like, remember we're trying to break stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, the singleton. Good job. Uh, I'll give you my student number when I was a student max. 0244968. I think that's what it was. And I got a hundred. Because I'm a genius. Uh, oh yes, same list. Uh, and I have to put this. Okay, so that's the third one that you guys have to do. Uh, how much time do I got? Three minutes? Do I have anything else here? Oh boy. Okay, so you guys should go through the remaining two questions here and try to come up with test case. Like, go through every function in today's slides and implement it. And implement it with doc strings. And do doc string testing on your function to ensure that it's working. Friday, I'll have an answer as to what we're supposed to be doing with dictionaries, although I don't know what Friday, I'm supposed to be teaching you Friday yet. So at the moment, it's just more computer science will be taught on Friday, right? You guys have a good day.